Friday is upon us. Thank goodness. So here we are. Um, we want to do something different today, John. We were talking about uh, what to do with these readings. So we wanted to go back to Genesis. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't um, realize is that to our point about Genesis and not being to be read literally, there are actually two creation stories, and some would actually argue there are three creation stories if you lump in John John's. 1. Yep. Yep. Uh, which Pastor John preached about three weeks ago, I think, I think three, so. three or four weeks ago, something like that. Um, but um, but there are two creation stories in Genesis. The first one starts with what John's going to read, and then the second one starts the next chapter. The next chapter with what I'll read, and, and we want to kind of play with them a little bit because they're different. Because they are different. Different. I, I, I hope you'll see in this that there's maybe different purposes. Mm -hmm. So I'll hop in. So, yeah, go ahead. so it's Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And then uh, we're going to skip ahead to Genesis 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Yeah, let's, we'll stop there. Sure. Why don't we stop there? That's kind of the intro part, just like you had the intro part there. Um so, real different stories. Considerably. <laughs> real different starting. Yeah. And, and I think it, it's helpful for to kind of go back to where we were on Monday, I think. These stories are written considerably later than we think. Mm -hmm. These are written, you know... 700, 500, 500 BC. In the midst of, you know... The Babylonian exile, the return from exile. Long after Abraham, long after Moses, long after Egypt. Yes. Long after the judges and most of the kings even. Yeah. And I think if you want to want to boil these down to to why, why, why write this, why put it in the Bible, these are what I would call making meaning stories. And I think in this first one, and we talked about this on Monday, the Israelites are in in Babylon, are coming conquered by Persia, and are moving back. And they're trying to figure out, experiencing the chaos of life, where they have no choices, they have no freedom. And they're throwing that experience up against what God has done. And in this first part of Genesis... It's really a story of how does God take chaos and give it space, but make a separate space where God lives, moves, creates, put order in. I think that's kind of the meaning of this one, of God, God sees chaos, God does something about it, and in doing something about it, God sets in motion this big creative act which ultimately ends with people, mm -hmm. where God sort of sets boundaries and methodically makes, you know, takes one step and another step and another step and another step, and humanity becomes really the pinnacle of that story of God's great creation. Right. And then Genesis 2 is, is different in that God starts with, humankind where the the first line is you know god god sees this world but god's fundamental problem is 
there's no man to till it or no human to till it. And God starts first with humans mm -hmm. and, and sees in humanity really the relationship's the most important part. Or I think in the tension between these two, you have, you know, cosmic God and cosmic chaos versus relational God, mm -hmm. God's interaction with humankind. There's a tension between these two stories that people who are living a tense experience are trying to right. cling to and make meaning out of. Right. And in the Old Testament, um, and we've talked about this in one of the classes we've taught over the years, in the, in the Old Testament in particular, there are different sources for each story. Mm -hmm. This isn't the only time when you get a story that's told and then they tell the same story, but it's just a little bit different or it's a little bit different. And, and, and if you read through the Old Testament, there's, when they're wandering in the wilderness, for example, um, you'll get a story uh, about you know, something that's transpired um, with the Israelites. And it might be that they didn't have water or food or something like that. And then you have another story that's told a chapter or two later where they don't have food and they don't have water. And it's very similar, but it's just a little bit different. Those are just different sources. Those are different sources that they're being told. And there is like the priestly source and the... Oh boy, the priestly, the Yahwist, the Deuteronomist, and the Elohist. Elohist, that's it. And so each one is kind of treats God very different. And John talked about one of the differences um, when he said, in the first story, you kind of get big cosmic God dealing with cosmic chaos and everything. In the second one, and, and you get that, right? In the beginning was Tohu Wabohu, formless void. There was chaos and the face of the deep and the dome in the sky. And it's all grandeur. Genesis 2 describes a God who's playing in the mud. Yeah, kind of a, you know, and even further out of, out of this, you get a God who, you know, walks in the garden. Right. And a God who, you know, does that daily and, right. and wonders where Adam and Eve are. Right. I can't find you. Where are you? Right. You get kind of this kindly, more genteel, to borrow a bad phrase, down-to-earth version of God. Yeah. And in the first story, you don't get Adam and Eve at all. Like there's there's no interaction, really, between God and Adam and and any people. Adam and Eve aren't even mentioned. Um, in the second story, Adam, which in Hebrew means the mud man, mud man, um, <laughs> that that God has this whole, as John said, this whole relational thing. That's where we get the story of the apple, not the apple, but the fruit and the snake and the tree and, you know, the expulsion from the garden and everything. And it's a very different kind of telling of the story. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the, there's similarity here in, in both. I mean, God does the same things in a jumbled order. But I think in this first story, as, as we've been kind of talking God almost seems like a project manager that's going, all right, where's my list here? I am going to do this on this day, this on this day. And there's a real fundamental distance right. between God, what God creates and, and, you know, God declares all of it good and human beings are very good. But it's just like, okay, yep, that was nice. On to the next thing, on to the next thing. And then in the second Genesis account, it's really, I think, the God that most of us believe in our heart of hearts, who is fundamentally concerned with what we're doing, how we're doing, mm -hmm. is, is an active participant, which, I mean, I'm sure both of these stories really belie where people are of, you know, we're in the midst of this really tumultuous thing, and for some people... God is readily discernible in the midst of it, walking with people. And for other people, maybe God moved back a step, or they feel that they God, feel like God, God has moved back yep. a step. And, you know, 
both of these stories are in our text. Both of them are right. are, are found to be meaningful for people. But I think it goes to sort of where we are. We all experience God differently. Right. Some some people have that feeling of at times God feels removed and distant, and other times God's waiting for you in the garden to take a stroll. And I think that's what makes it so great for today is in the midst of all of our chaos and and whatnot that we have right now, there are people that are going to hear this, and some are like, no, nah, God's right there with me all the time. I know that's true. And there's others that are saying, why, God? What's up with this? And why have you yep. moved? Which is really the same thing as saying, why have you forsaken us? Yep. You know, and, and so I, I like the way you put that, John. And I think that's the reason why we wanted to kind of compare these two, to be able to say, you know, there are different sources that put them, that, that, that kind of place them into our midst in the scriptures. But they do represent very much how we experience God. Yeah. So, good All right, stuff. Let, let me pray us out of here. Right. Gracious Heavenly Father, keep us this weekend as we move through this just unpredictable world. Keep us firm in the hope and the promise that there is one thing that is always predictable. And that's you. Your constancy, your presence, your love and your care for us, whether we feel you close by or far off. Keep us this weekend. Give us rest. Refresh us for another week next week. And fill us with the joy of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Enjoy your weekend. See you on Sunday. Bye-bye.